is Babyliss A. Amaro, your reporter for today. So for today, I will discuss Article 1171 up to 1178. First article is Article 1171. Article 1171, Responsibility arising from fraud is demandable in all obligations. Any waiver of an action for future fraud is void. In fraud, there is presence of deliberate intention to cause damage or injury, while in negligence, there is no intention. In fraud, waiver of the liability for future fraud is void, while in negligence, waiver may be allowed in such a certain sense. In fraud, there must be clearly proven. In negligence, there is presumed from the violation of a contractual obligation. Lastly, in fraud, liability cannot be mitigated or reduced by the court, while in negligence, liability may be reduced according to circumstances. Responsibility arising from fraud demandable. Responsibility arising from fraud can be demanded with respect to all kinds of obligation and unlike in the case of responsibility arising from negligence, the court is not given the power to mitigate or reduce the damages to be awarded. There are two kinds of fraud, the incidental fraud and Cassante fraud. In Article 1171, it pertains to incidental fraud or fraud employed in the fulfillment of an obligation. Ang sinasabi nga dito na ang responsibility arising from fraud can be demanded with respect to all kinds of obligation alike from responsibility arising from negligence. Because of that, lagi talagang demandable ang liability because of fraud unlike sa liability because of negligence na not all times. But, yun nga, the court is not given the power to mitigate or reduce the damages to be awarded. Ibig sabihin lamang nito, na sa fraud is fixed na yung damages to be awarded unlike sa negligence na negotiable. Kasi, kapag negligence, the court had the decision to mitigate the damages kasi kapag negligence, not necessarily intentional, unlike from fraud, talagang intentional yan. It is serious and evil. A waiver of an action for future fraud is void or no effect as being against the law and public policy. In this article, 1171, ang tinutukoy dito ay future fraud. That means, any waiver of an action for future fraud is void because it is against the law. A contrary rule would encourage the perpetration of fraud because the obligor knows that even if he should commit fraud, he would not be liable for it anyway. So, mas magkakaroon sila ng lakas ng loob na mag-perpetrate ang fraud kasi in the end, hindi naman sila magiging liable sa actions na ginawa nila. Thus, making the obligation illusionary. A past fraud can be the subject of a valid waiver because the waiver can be considered as an act of generosity and magnanimity on the part of the party who is the victim of the fraud. Any waiver of an action resulting from past fraud is valid. What the law prohibits is waiver anterior to the fraud and to the knowledge thereof by the aggrieved party. And we have to take note that the past fraud can be a subject of a valid waiver because the waiver can be considered as an act of generosity and magnanimity on the part of the party who is the victim of the fraud. So, kasi kung nalaman mo na it has been committed in the past and it has been come to your senses, now, and when you wave mo yun, therefore, it is an act of generosity on your part. In past fraud, it renounces the effect of the fraud that is the right of indemnity of the party entitled thereto. As promised to deliver 120 cabans of rice of a particular brand and quality to B at the rate of 10 cabans a month, S cannot make an agreement with B whereby B will not file an action in court against S should commit fraud in the performance of his obligation. This waiver of an action for future fraud is void. So dito, hindi pa nakakamit yung fraud when a waive mo na agad yung liability. If ever man na nagkaroon ng agreement between S and B, na sige, any future fraud is deemed waive given this agreement, hindi pa din ito okay. Kasi nga, ang future fraud is void because it is against the law and public policy. 
it only perpetrates the commission of fraud. Hence, B can still bring an action against S for damages arising from the fraud. But once fraud is committed, B with full knowledge thereof can waive his right to indemnity as an act of forgiveness on his part. Ito yung sinasabi ko kanina na generosity or magnanimity. In this case, the fraud was committed and B has a knowledge about the commission of fraud done by S. Alam na ni B na niloko siya and then pinatawad niya. Pwede yun kasi this is a past fraud. Pero yung hindi pa nakokommit yung fraud, yung lolokohin ka pa lang at sinabi mo na sige okay lang nalokohin mo ako, that is against the law and public policy. Let's proceed to Article 1172. Article 1172, Responsibility arising from negligence in the performance of every kind of obligation is also demandable, but such liability may be regulated by the courts according to the circumstances. Responsibility arising from negligence, demandable. In the performance of every kind of obligation, the debtor is also liable for damages resulting from his negligence. In Article 1171, it talks about responsibility arising from fraud. In Article 1172, it talks about responsibility arising from negligence. It is also demandable. Same lang. Sabi nga natin kanina, demandable din yung responsibility arising from fraud, pero ang kaibahan, kapag negligence, the court may mitigate or reduce the amount of damages to be awarded unlike from fraud na hindi talaga pwedeng i-mitigate. Because negligence is not as serious as fraud. In negligence, there is no bad faith or it didn't deliver intention to cause damages or injury. And kung ang both parties or transactions are both guilty and mutually negligent in the performance of their obligations, then the fault of one may cancel or neutralize the negligence of the other. Validity of favor of action arising from negligence. An action for future negligence may be renounced except where the nature of the obligation requires the exercise of extraordinary diligence as in the case of common carriers. The waiver is valid, so pede, except when the nature of the obligation requires the exercise of extraordinary diligence. There are different kind of care or diligence. Ang halimbawa doon is yung diligence of a good father to a family or slight diligence. Pero, ang sinasabi dito, kapag express and provided na extraordinary diligence yung dapat na exercise doon ng isang party, therefore, hindi daw pwedeng i-wave doon yung future negligence. Kanina, ang future fraud, bawal talaga. Itong future negligence, pwede mong i-wave except when the nature of the obligation requires the extraordinary diligence. Where negligence shows bad faith, it is considered equivalent to fraud. Any waiver of an action for future negligence of this kind is therefore void. There are negligence kasi na bad faith. Yung mga gross negligence, for example. And in that case, when it's already so gross, na wala talagang in-exercise na kahit anong degree of care or kahit man lang slight degree of diligence, consider natin yon na gross negligence which is equivalent of fraud. Bad faith does not simply connote negligence or bad judgment, causing damages to another. So any waiver of an action of future negligence of this kind is therefore void. So, hindi lahat ng future negligence ay dapat nating i-waive. Generally, Pwede nating i-waive ang responsibility arising from negligence except on these two instances. 1. When the nature of the obligation requires extraordinary diligence. And 2. When the negligence is so gross or when it shows bad faith that is equivalent to fraud. Kinds of negligence according to the source of obligation. Contractual negligence or culpa contractual or negligence in contracts resulting in their breach. It is not a source of obligation. Matatandaan natin na diniscuss ni Sir na there are five sources of obligation, namely law, contracts, quasi-contracts, acts or omissions punished by law, and quasi-delict. So, yun nga, 
ang sinasabi dito na ang contractual negligence ay hindi isa sa mga sources of obligation. Ang source of obligation doon is actually the contract itself. Kasi nga, nagkaroon ng kulpa contractual, so the source of obligation is the contract. If S entered into a contract of sale with B to deliver a specific horse on a certain day, take note that there is specific horse and there is also specific day of delivery. And the horse died through the negligence of S before delivery. So, namatay ang specific horse bago i-deliver. Now, in this case, si S is liable for damages to B for having failed to fulfill a pre-existing obligation because of his negligence. And this is what we call culpa contractual. Again, ang source of obligation dito is the pre-existing contract na meron sila, not the negligence. Number two, civil negligence or culpa aquiliano or negligence which by itself is the source of an obligation between the parties not so related before by any pre-existing contract. It is also called tort or quasi-delic. It is a source of obligation according to Article 1157, the fifth source of obligation. Assume now that the horse belongs to and is in possession of B. So, yung horse kanina, nasa possession na ng buyer. The negligence of S, which results in the death of the horse, is culpa aquiliana. In this case, there is no pre-existing contractual relation between S and B. The negligence itself is the source of liability. Kasi nga, ang quasi-delic is under the source of obligation according to Article 1157. Number 3, criminal negligence or culpa criminal or negligence resulting in the commission of a crime. It happened when the crime is committed. In negligence cases, the agreed party may choose between a criminal action under Article 100 of the Revised Penal Code or create an action for quasi-delic under Article 2176 of the Civil Code. This was the two options that are available in this case. But what is prohibited here guys is under Article 1277 of the New Civil Code, double recovery for the same negligent act is prohibited. So, mamili ka lang kung dadaanin mo siya sa Article 100 of the Revised Penal Code or Article 2176 of the Civil Code. Bawa lang itong pagsabayin. But B cannot recover damages twice for the same act or omission of S. In other words, responsibility for quasi-delic is not demandable together with the civil liability arising from criminal offense, Article 2177. Effect of negligence on the part of the injured party When the plaintiff owed negligence was the immediate and proximate cause of his injury, he cannot recover damages. But if his negligence was only contributory, the immediate and proximate cause of the injury being the defendant's lack of due care, the plaintiff may recover damages. But the courts shall mitigate the damages to be awarded. So sa first case, it depends. Kung yung negligence pa ni plaintiff ay immediate and proximate cause of his injury, then he cannot recover damages. Ang plaintiff po, yun yung naghahad lang o lumalaban sa korte para i-air out yung grievances na meron siya. Siya yung injured party na naghahabol dito. Kung mapatunayan naman na immediate or proximate cause yung injury na nasustain niya, yung kapabayaan or negligence in that case, he cannot recover damages. Ibig sabihin, kapag siya lang yung may kasalanan ng injury na natamu niya, he cannot recover damages. So, for a second case naman, what if yung immediate and proximate injury was brought about by the defendant pero si plaintiff ay merong contributory negligence? The effect is that the plaintiff may recover damages but the court shall mitigate the damages to be awarded. So, yung defendant dito is siya yung nireklamo ni plaintiff. Kung napatunayan sa korte na yung defendant, yung kanyang kapabayaan or negligence ay immediate or proximate cause, then siya ay liable. However, kung napatunayan din naman na meron ding parte kay plaintiff na nakadagdag sa injury, ay pwedeng mitigate or bawasan ng korte yung i-award na damages kay plaintiff. Ang tawag po dito ay contributory negligence. The bus company is not liable for damages because the cause of peace injury 
is his own negligence. Both parties ay may kasalanan. Si P na hindi nakinig sa konduktor at ang bus driver na nag-drive recklessly at intoxicated, sila ay may parehas na may kasalanan to the injury of P. Since si P ay may contributory negligence sa nangyari, therefore, the damages that will be awarded to the bus driver should be mitigated and reduced by the court. Here, P cannot recover. He should have been on his guard against a contingency as natural as that of losing his balance to a greater or lesser extent when the bus rounded the curve. In other words, to be entitled to damages, it is not required that the negligence of the defendant should be the sole cause of the damages. Kasi, even if meron namang contributory negligence, pwede pa ding maging entitled to damages pero mitigated na or reduced na yung amount. Let's move on to Article 1173. Article 1173, the fault or negligence of the obligor consists in the omission of that diligence which is required by the nature of the obligation and corresponds with the circumstances of the person, of the time, and of the place. When negligence shows bad faith, the provisions of Articles 1171 and 2201 Paragraph 2 shall apply. If the law or contract does not state the diligence which is to be observed in the performance, that which is expected of a good father of a family shall be required. Fault or negligence is defined by the above provision. According to the Supreme Court, negligence is the failure to observe for the protection of the interest of another person that degree of care, precaution, and vigilance which the circumstances justly demand whereby such other person suffers injury. If the obligor does not perform the diligence that has been stipulated in the contract or the law, he shall be liable for damages. And if it is not stated in the law or contract, the diligence to be observed is a good father of a family is expected. And there is diligence that does not need to be agreed upon for it to arise. Extraordinary diligence must be observed by the obligor. Factors to be considered 1. Nature of the obligation 2. Circumstances of the person 3. Circumstances of time and 4. Circumstances of the place Kinds of diligence required That agreed upon by the parties orally or in writing It is stipulated in the contract or by the parties the kind of diligence to be observed in the performance of the delivery or service Ito yung mga napag-usapan ng both parties either in oral and writing, and that's the law. In the absence of stipulation, that required by law in the particular case. There are diligences that do not need to be agreed upon or stipulated in the contract before diligence arise. The law has implemented certain diligence or extraordinary care that should be observed. So, in here, papasok na yung batas. Walang agreement yung parties as to the diligence required that need to be exercised. So, doon tayo sa kung ano yung provided by law. For example, Jose is a jeep na driver and Anna is a passenger. Hindi naman sila nag-usap na ang diligence required nila, for example, is light diligence lang. Walang ganun. So, you follow what the law provides. And ang sabi doon, kapag common carrier ka, you have to exercise the extraordinary diligence for the safety of the passengers. If both the contract and law are silent, then the diligence expected of a good father of family. The law or contract does not state the diligence which is to be observed in the performance, that which is expected of a good father of a family shall be required. The fourth one is Article 1174. Article 1174, except in the cases expressly specified by the law or when it is otherwise declared by stipulation or when the nature of the obligation requires the assumption of risk, no person shall be responsible for those events which could not be foreseen or which, though foreseen, were inevitable. A fortuitous event is any event which cannot be foreseen or which, though foreseen, is inevitable. Stated otherwise, it is an event which is either impossible to foresee or impossible to avoid. So, dito na papasok yung mahirap mag-comply sa obligation because of fortuitous event. But, there are requisites in order to apply fortuitous event. 
ano ba kasing kahalagahan kung bakit kailangan nating malaman ang mga requisites na ito? Kasi po, kapag may fortuitous event, the obligor is not liable generally. It will exempt the obligor to the fulfillment of his obligations Acts of man. Strictly speaking, fortuitous event is an event independent of the will of the obligor but not of other human wills. Acts of God. They refer to what we call major or those events which are totally independent from the will of every human being. Ordinary fortuitous events or those events which are common and which the contracting parties could reasonably foresee. Example of this is rain. Kasi di ba, sa mga balita, may mga nagmamonitor ng weather natin. So rain is a fortuitous event, meaning hindi natin mapipigilan na circumstances, pero alam natin kung kailan mangyayari o darating. Second, extraordinary fortuitous events of those events which are uncommon and which the contracting parties could not have reasonably foreseen. Dito naman, Ito yung mga event na hindi talaga natin inaasahan na mangyayari. Like earthquake, hindi naman siya tulad ng rain na nandedetect kung kailan mangyayari as well as sa fire and sa unusual floods. Now, let's talk about the fortuitous event. Kailan ba natin masasabi na ang isang event ay fortuitous event? First, the event must be independent of the human will or at least of the debtor's will. So, independent of human will. Kumbaga, hands off. Walang kinalaman even though obligor or any human being. Second, the event could not be foreseen or if foreseen is inevitable. Hindi mo siya mapo-foresee or kung ma-foresee mo man, unavoidable. Third, the event is must be of such a character as to render it impossible for the debtor to comply with his obligation in a normal manner. Kasi, Kahit na nag-exist tong first two, pero kaya naman mag-comply in a normal manner, hindi ka ba din may exempt sa mga liability? And you always take note on the word normal manner. Because kung hindi normal manner na yung fulfillment ng obligation, ibig sabihin fortuitous event na yun. Fourth, the debtor must be free from any participation in or the aggravation of the injury to the creditor. That is, there is no a concurrent negligence on his party. Meaning, the four requisites must concur in order to exempt the obligor from his liability. First, when expressly specified by law. So, ibig sabihin, kahit may fortuitous event, hindi pa din exempt ang obligor from liability. The debtor is guilty of fraud negligence or delay or contravention of the tenor of the obligation. Ang ibig sabihin lamang nito ay kahit may fortuitous event, kung nag-exist naman talaga na guilty ng fraud, ng negligence, delay, or contravention of the tenor, kahit may fortuitous event, liable pa din siya. The debtor has promised to deliver the same specific thing to two or more persons who do not have the same interest. For it would be impossible for the debtor to actually comply with his obligation to two or more persons even without fortuitous event taking place. Kasi nga, for example, kung pinangako mo to deliver the specific thing to two persons, kahit naman walang fortuitous event, ay eh imposible talagang ma-deliver yung isang specific thing to two persons that do not have the same interest. The obligation to deliver a specific thing arises from a crime. Kapag naman may obligation to deliver a specific thing and this obligation arises in a criminal offense, ibig sabihin kahit may fortuitous event na wala yung bagay or na damage yung bagay, liable ka pa din. The thing to be delivered is generic. So this time, kapag generic naman, the debtor can still comply with his obligation by delivering another thing of the same kind in accordance of the principle, genus never perishes. When declared by stipulation, ang sistema dito, kahit may fortuitous event, kasi diba, sabi natin na ang general rule, kapag may fortuitous event, na wala or nasira yung bagay, absuelto ka sa liabilities. The obligation is extinguished. Pero dito naman, meron silang usapan or agreement. Yung both parties agreed that kahit may fortuitous event, 
liable ka pa din. It should be clearly and expressly stated or provided yung liability in case of fortuitous event. When the nature of the obligation requires the assumption of risk. Here, risk of loss or damage is an essential element in obligation. Ang cost ng loss is fortuitous event. Nasunog daw yung bahay ni B. Yung bahay ay insured kay C amounting 100,000 pesos. Insured against fire. Tapos, yung bahay ni B na insured ay nasunog through accidental fire. And that accidental fire is fortuitous event. Therefore, dapat generally, kung iisipin natin ang general rule, dapat hindi liable si C, the insurance company. Pero, that is the nature of obligation ni C, which require the assumption of risk. Kasi, that's the very essence of insurance. Now, let's discuss Article 1175. Article 1175 Usurious transactions shall be governed by special laws. Simple loan or mutuum is a contract whereby one of the parties delivers to another money or other consumable thing upon the condition that the same amount of the same kind and quality shall be paid. It may be gratuitous or with stipulation to pay interest. In simple meaning, ito ay utang. As simple as that. Usury is a contracting for or receiving interest in excess of the amount allowed by law for the loan or use of money, goods, shuttles, or credits. Ibig sabihin naman ito, excessive yung pag mo ng interest or pag-collect mo ng interest. There are certain percentage in interest kasi that are stated and allowed by law. So kapag excessive na doon or mas mataas sa percentage na yung kinokolekta mo, definitely, Mali na yun. Meron bang allowed ang batas kung magkano lang dapat ang interest na i-charge mo? Depende. It depends. If we were talking here the date prior to the issuance of a central circular number 905, kasi prior to that, meron talagang legal interest which is 12% na in-impose. And in anything and in excess of that, it is usurious and therefore, it is contrary to the law. However, now, Usury is now legally non-existent. So, ibig sabihin, wala na amount of interest prescribed by law. So, it depends upon the parties kung magkano yung interest na napag-usapan provided that it shouldn't be too large. The interest must be lawful and unquestionable. First, the payment of interest must be expressly stipulated. Second, the agreement must be in writing. And third, the interest must be lawful. At this time, let's tackle about Article 1176. Article 1176. The receipt of the principal by the creditor without reservation with respect to the interest shall give rise to the presumption that said interest has been paid. The receipt of a later installment of a debt without reservation as to prior installments shall likewise raise the presumption that such installments has been paid presumption is meant the inference of a fact not actually known arising from its usual connection with another which is known or proved. Si D ay humiram ng 1,000 pesos kay C. Later, si D ay nagpakita ng resibo na may permanency. The fact not actually known is the payment of D. So established fact is that may initial na resibo si C pero hindi malinaw kung may actual payment ba talaga Dahil nagpakita lang ng resibo si D. So in that case, the presumption on that is that the obligation has been paid. Unless proved otherwise by C that D forged the signature of C in the receipt. Kasi nga naman, logically, bakit ka naman mag issue ng resibo doon sa nangutang sa'yo acknowledging na the receipt of the payment thereof kung hindi naman talaga siya nagbayad. So kapag nagpakita si D ng resibo kay C, Ang presumption doon ay yung utang or obligation ay payad na. Conclusive presumption, one which cannot be contradicted, like the presumption that everyone is conclusively presumed to know the law. Disputable or rebuttable law, one which can be contradicted or rebutted by presenting proof to the contrary. 
Ang situation dito, si C nag-issued ng resibo na ang amount lang na nakalagay doon ay amount lang ng principal which is 1,000 pesos. It is presumed that the interest has been previously paid by D because normally the payment of interest precedes payment of the principal. Precedes meaning dapat nauuna. Customarily, sa practice, unang binabayaran ang interest bago ang principal. But that is not a conclusive presumption. That's a mere disputable presumption. So, noong nag-issue sa C ng resibo na ang binayadan ni B ay 10,000, na principal ang presumption doon, bayad na din yung interest. Pero, pwede pa din naman i-rebat ni C na hindi pa bayad yung interest. Second to my last report is Article 1177. Article 1177. The creditors, after having pursued the property in possession of the debtor to satisfy their claims, may exercise all the rights and bring all the actions of the latter for the same purpose, save those which are inherent in his person. They may also impugn the acts which the debtor may have done to defraud them. In case the debtor does not comply with his obligation, the creditor may avail himself of the following remedies to satisfy his claim. First, exact fulfillment of a specific performance with the right to damages. So, kung pwede naman i-perform pa din yung obligation for exact fulfillment nga kung ano yung unang obligation niya, of course, with the right to damages. So, for example, may utang ka na 400,000 and may kakayahan ka naman na magbayad. So, ang gagawin or ang remedy lang ni creditor is to demand na bayadan mo ang 400,000 with the right to damages. Second, Pursue the viable or not exempt from attached under the law property of the debtor. In connection with the example in number 1, for example, the debtor doesn't have exact amount of 400,000 para mabayad ng si creditor. Ibig sabihin ba nun, for gan na yung 400,000? Hindi. Dito na pumapasok itong pangalawang remedy na sinasabi ng batas na pwedeng mag-pursue ng viable properties ang debtor. Ibig sabihin ng liable, pwede mo yung i-attach or ask yung court na i yung property ng debtor para pwede niya ibenta sa mga auction sale and yung pera from that is can be applied to the debt or obligation of the creditor. For example, ang debtor ay may 100,000 lamang na perang pangbayad. E di, may 300,000 pang kulang. E etong si debtor may car worth 200,000. So, pwedeng pumunta si debtor court and i-attach yung car niya para i-levy and yung perang na mabibenta doon ng car ay mapupunta kay creditor. So, ang perang na bayad na is 300,000 pesos. After having pursued the property and possession of the debtor, exercise all the rights like the right to redeem and bring all the actions of the debtor like the right to collect from the debtor of his debtor, except those inherent in or personal to the person of the latter, such as the right to vote, to hold office, to receive legal support, or to revoke a donation on the ground of ingratitude. Kapag kulang pa din yung bayad ng debtor sa creditor and wala nang ma-pursue na property, meron pa bang pwedeng gawin si creditor? Ang sinasabi ng batas, yes, meron pa. So for example, si creditor nakapagbayad na ng cash, 100,000 pesos and 200,000 pesos from the car na binenta. So, may kulang pa na 100,000 pesos. So, si creditor may pautang na third party. For example, ang utang ng third party ay 50,000 pesos. Nakita niya ngayon na ang creditor na may pautang pala yung debtor niya. So, yung creditor is pwede niyang habulin yung third party which is may utang kay debtor na sa kanya na dumiretso magbayad. However, may exemption pa din doon. As a creditor, hindi mo pwedeng sakupin yung mga karapatan ng debtor na very personal sa kanya. Halimbawa, to receive a legal support. For example, Ana is a minor and Jose is her guardian. Si Jose ay may duty to support Ana financially. Hindi pwede na yung financial support na matatanggap ni Ana from Jose ay ibibigay kay creditor. Hindi pwede yun. Kasi, it is inherit or personal to the person. Fourth, ask the court to rescind or impugn 
acts or contracts which the debtor may have done to defraud him when he cannot in an other manner recover his claims. The creditor may ask the court to resent or impugn acts made by the debtor to defraud him. In that case, the, pro the proceeds will come to the creditor. However, the amount that will be given to the creditor is yun lang na kulang sa utang ni debtor. The last article that I will discuss for today is Article 1178. Article 1178. Subject to the laws, all rights acquired in virtue of an obligation are transmissible if there has been no stipulation to the contrary. All rights acquired in virtue of an obligation are generally transmittable. The exception of this law are the following. First, prohibited by law. When prohibited by law, like the rights in partnership, agency, and comodatum, which are purely personal in character. Ang general rule nga, pwede mong ipasa yung iyong right acquired in virtue of obligation. Pero kapag ito ay pinagbawal ng batas, edi hindi pwede. No transmissibility of rights. By the contract of partnership, two or more persons bind themselves to contribute money, property, or industry to a common fund with intention of dividing the profits among themselves. For example, Anna and Jose made a partnership but suddenly, Anna died. So the right of Anna cannot be transmitted to her child or to her husband because the partnership is highly fiduciary, it is purely personal in character. By the contract of agency, a person binds himself to render some service or to do something in a representation of or behalf of another with the consent or authority of the latter. Ang contract by agency is fiduciary in nature din like partnership. For example, Anna is the principal and Jose is the agent. Jose, that is the agent, cannot transmit his rights by virtue of the contract that was made between them. By the contract of comodatum, one of the parties delivers to another something not consumable so that the latter may use the same for a certain time and return it. Comodatum is essentially gratuitous. For example, Anna lend her book of obligon to Jose. So that book, the obligation contract, is comodatum because it is not consumable. Jose can use that book for a certain of time and return it to Anna. Prohibited by stipulation of the parties. The stipulation upon the debt of the creditor, the obligation shall be extinguished or the creditor cannot assign his credit to another. The contract or agreement is the law between the parties. Such stipulation, being contrary to the general rule, must be clearly proved or at the very least clearly implied from the wordings or terms of the contract itself. Always remember that ignorance of the law excuses no one.